Funding for Beyond Kitty Hawk is made possible by the Joseph R. White Foundation in honor of the nonprofit Aero Club of New England, dedicated to the celebration and promotion of aviation through safety education, scholarships, and awards. Flying is perhaps the most dramatic of recent scientific attainments. My flight was but one step in this long progress. The first artificial Earth satellite in the world has now been created. That's one small step for man. Welcome home, Columbia. Beautiful, beautiful. In less than a century, humankind has gone from dreaming of flying with the birds to soaring above the Earth at supersonic speeds. Reflecting on these amazing advances usually begins with two defining moments, the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk and man landing on the moon. And we're getting a picture on the TV. Yet there were thousands of aviation pioneers in between courageous pilots who dared to see how far our new gravity-defying reality could go. Most of their names will likely be forgotten, but their legacies live on. While we celebrate the Wright brothers' place in history, New Englanders can also be proud of the pioneers from their own backyards. New England has been enriched by extraordinary men and women who started some of America's first airports, developed the first navigation systems, risked their lives to test new flight technologies, fought for their country, and shattered society stereotypes about race and gender. Well, I like to fly low. <laughs> I like to watch the trees going by. <laughs> I'm not a high altitude girl at all. I like the speed of it, and it's very hard to get speed in a little aircraft. And the only way you can get it is to fly low enough to watch stuff going by you. Ann Wood is not used to getting what she wants the first time. When she tried to get into President Roosevelt's civilian pilot training program, she was initially rebuffed for being a woman. When she first tried to get into an experimental World War II program for women pilots, she was told she was too young. But Ann Wood never took no for an answer. I wasn't one of those that dreamed of flying at all. Ann Wood grew up in Waldeboro, Maine, feeling far more comfortable in the world of boys than the world of girls. I was always in corduroy pants, and my parents gave me a whole football gear at Christmas time so that I could dress up like a football player and go out and play football by myself. As a youth, the self-described tomboy had shown no particular interest in airplanes. Becoming a pilot was not one of her childhood dreams. But in her late teens, a career opportunity would come knocking in her local newspaper. Nearby Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine, had 12 openings for their civilian pilot training program. The civilian pilot training program was one of President Roosevelt's visions for the future. And he passed legislation knowing full well that we were going to get into World War II. Knowing America would soon need thousands of pilots, Roosevelt arranged for the government to entice future recruits with free flight training. My mother thought it'd be a very good idea, and why didn't I go get it? She pushed me to it. She gave me the idea to want to do it, because I didn't have it on my own. I was finished college. I was going to have to go look for a job, and why didn't I go and try? Bowden wasn't as enthusiastic about training women pilots. Despite meeting all the physical requirements, Wood was told to hold off, even though there were two unfilled openings. Bowdoin at the time was an all-male institution, and they didn't want me. And it seems strange, but they advertised in the Brunswick papers for a boy to come to learn to fly for free for two weeks, and nobody came. Then wonderful president of Bowdoin by the name of President Sills said, well, she'll be down there on the water. We were going to be on float planes, and um, nobody will know she's here and uh, 
let's go with her. Upon graduation from the civilian pilot program in 1940, Wood eventually became a flight instructor at Bowdoin, but most of her students would soon abandon her. After the attack at Pearl Harbor, the military was grabbing every pilot it could get. Wood wanted to volunteer too. All of my students had already signed up for their service. They were either going into the Army, the Air Corps, or the Navy. So I then began to search as to where and how a woman could serve. And that was a long and tedious search because I was turn constantly turned down. It's like writing a novel and you're turned down. On January 24, 1942, Wood received a telegram she would remember for the rest of her life. It came from Jackie Cochran, the celebrated racing pilot and Manhattan socialite. Cochran, one of the most famous women in America at the time, was trying to form an all-women's pilot corps for the United States military, but the Air Force turned her down. The British, however, wanted her to recruit 200 American women pilots to ferry new military aircraft from the factory to the front lines. Cochran only agreed to recruit 24 pilots, hoping the overseas experiment would convince the U.S. military they could use women's help too. The telegram basically said she was recruiting for the British Air Transport Auxiliary, and um, if I had the qualifications, she would interview me. She sent it to every woman pilot that had 350 hours. Initially, I was not accepted. I was amongst the youngest, and I also had the least time at that time. Some were married with children, and she really didn't want to get into that kind of a situation where women were going off and leaving their children. So she eventually got down to me. I was terribly eager. We were, I came from a very patriotic family, and uh, I wanted to be a participant. Over the course of the war, Wood would fly 75 different kinds of aircraft, most of them British Spitfires. She was stationed in Birmingham, near the RAF's largest Spitfire factory. Oh, this is that magic little book that tells you how to fly every aircraft if you've forgotten for any reason. And this you carried with you all the time. If you were ferrying an aircraft for the first time, a new aircraft, you spent more time prepping on it before you left your base in the morning. But you didn't necessarily always have that kind of time. So therefore, this little book was very important to you. We were not to go through the clouds, but of course you couldn't fly in England without doing that and get anywhere in all probability. So you had to have a little bit of risk in you. Bear in mind that my group had no radios, so we were had to use time and distance only. You get lost, you're in fog, and you don't know where the hell you are. Show you how safe uh, mechanically they were. I never had a bad takeoff from a factory. Though allies on the runway, British and American pilots often playfully ribbed one another. The Brits had a word for an aircraft if it wasn't working. They had it down as U.S., unserviceable. Well, some of our girls got spuce with rage about that. Imagine calling that U.S. <laughs> Uh, of course, I, and I think well, I thought it was funny, you see, it just depends how it struck you. In late September 1942, the United States declared its intention to also use women pilots. While some Americans flying for Britain were eager to come home, Wood never considered it. I was in the right theater. He had to retrain over here. He had to go to Sweetwater, Texas. Who wanted that when I was in the theater? Some of our girls did. They never felt comfortable in the foreign theater. I was perfectly at home and having a wonderful time and doing a more, I think, critical job and a hell of a lot more fun. Wood got closer to the action than she ever imagined. An after-dinner stroll in June 1944 still remains vivid in her memory. Suddenly, we had double summer time then, so it's 11 o'clock at night, still sort of light. And suddenly, the 
sky is ablaze with aircraft. You can't see the sky because it's just black, black, black aircraft. So we know that D-Day is on. Wood and some friends spent the next morning gathering strawberries and distributing them to troops waiting to storm the beaches at Normandy. It's June 6th. Strawberry time is marvelous over there. They're somehow they're much sweeter, succulent than ours. And um, what were the boys doing? All kinds of different things. You know, some were having their haircuts, some were writing letters, some were reading the comics, some were just a setting, and some were sleeping. And yet, as you gave them strawberries, and they were so appreciative of them, you knew that for many, that would be their last strawberry. Here is my uniform, in all its glory, made for me in 1942. And I guess its claim to fame is that I can, or my claim to fame is that I can still get into it. For her service to the Allies, Wood was awarded the King's Medal, one of Great Britain's highest military honors. Following the war, Wood served as an assistant to America's first civil air attache in London. She went on to several management posts in the airline industry, capping her career by becoming Pan Am's first woman vice president. Today, she continues to soar in the clouds, occasionally flying a Piper Arrow at Beverly Airport. While proud of her World War II accomplishments, Wood says she doesn't think of herself as an aviation pioneer. Well, you don't really have any control over your timing, do you? Who do you thank for that? <laughs> There's an organization called UFO. If you haven't heard of it, that stands for United Flying Octogenarians. Quite a few of those flying octogenarians have become flying nonagenarians. They've gone over into the 90s. By the time he turned 90, Crocker Snow had become a human museum of aviation history. His first sport flying license was signed by Orville Wright. He flew with Amelia Earhart before she was famous and he was a wing commander for the first B-29 bombing raids over Japan. But it was his expertise flying the Arctic Circle that thrust him in the middle of one of the most secretive chapters of World War II. Crocker Snow first got the flying bug at age five at the Harvard-Boston Aero Meet in 1910. The air show did much to popularize aviation in its early days with planes dropping smoke bombs and flying low over the grandstands. I can remember the people making a lot of money selling dark glasses so people could look up in the sky without hurting their eyes. At age nine, he became enthralled with the dogfights of World War I over Europe, where his older brothers Bill and Kitchell served as pilots. The younger Snow eventually would follow in the footsteps of his father, a prominent Massachusetts attorney, by enrolling at Harvard Law School. But his brother's legacy was stronger. He chose the cockpit over the courtroom. I liked mechanics. I liked things that ran, that you had to work to make them run. And I particularly liked them if they could fly, because I had two older brothers who had flown. And I was always wishing that I had been born a little bit earlier and could have joined them. While still a freshman at Harvard, Snow helped his brother Kitchell with mechanical adjustments on his Avro biplane, a Canadian training plane he bought unassembled for $200. During the biplane's maiden flight, the brothers switched off at the controls, an experience that inspired Crocker to join Kitchell in the Air National Guard. In 1927, Snow and some business partners launched Skyways, Inc., a flight school, passenger service, and airplane dealership all wrapped in one. While delivering planes from the factory to his hangars, the pilot discovered an unexpected navigation tool below. And I flew a lot of airplanes from Wichita back to Boston. A lot of cattle on the way. And sometimes I'd be flying along between Kansas City and Chicago or something, and the uh, cattle wouldn't even look at me. They'd go on munching. And then I, another time I'd fly a little different course, and they'd all scatter when they heard me. 
and I learned very early that the cattle on the ground learned when airplanes flew regular courses over them not to worry. And so that was a way of navigating. You could see whether you had cattle that dispersed when you flew over them. At Skyways, Snow and his partners set out to design their dream aircraft. All the airplanes we had were either seaplanes or land planes. And we figured that a combination of the two would really be the nuts. They called it the amphibian. And like a frog, it would function equally well on land or in the water but an overzealous test pilot crashed the prototype and Skyways decided to stick to selling airplanes from other manufacturers. Other avenues of the business, however, were flourishing. A year before she would become the first woman pilot to cross the Atlantic Ocean, Amelia Earhart hired Snow to fly her over Boston to drop leaflets for a local charity. Just before the U.S. entered World War II, the Army Air Corps assigned Snow to oversee the construction of air bases in Maine, Canada, Greenland, and Iceland, the vital North Atlantic route to assist besieged England. In addition, Snow mapped out alternate routes over the Arctic ice cap, contingency plans in the event the German Navy ever controlled the North Sea. His success in the Arctic caught the attention of his superiors. I was called to Washington. I didn't know what for, I was quite happy with what I was doing. And it was very super secret that uh, it was called the Bradley Mission. And uh, General Bradley had been appointed by the United States to meet with Stalin and try to work out a deal where we could get into Japan from the back door through Russia. Building air bases in Siberia would have put U.S. pilots only 565 nautical miles from Tokyo, well within range of the B-17 bomber. The next nearest base was the Mariana Islands in the South Pacific, 1,250 miles away. Stalin said yes, he would let us build airports from Alaska down to uh, the peninsula that's behind Japan. But he intimated that he would let us bring down a bunch of B-17s and park them there. And when the time was right, we'd jump Japan from the rear. Snow and his crew were sitting on the runway in Washington, ready to take off for Russia, when they were told to hold off. We found that Stalin had gotten in touch with uh, Roosevelt and said, oh, you misunderstood me. We'll be very happy to get your two airplanes and your plans for airports, but we will take them over at Nome in Alaska, and we will fly the airplanes and build the runways and be in charge of it. So we said to hell with that. Snow was later assigned to a propaganda and damage assessment unit as part of the atomic bombings in Japan. His planes flew target reconnaissance and dropped leaflets, warning Japan to evacuate its cities following the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. For all his military glory, Snow became most synonymous in Boston with civilian aviation. Just before the war, he was appointed as the first director of the Massachusetts Aeronautics Commission, where he later returned and served for nearly 35 years. In the government post, he helped develop the Commonwealth's network of airports and draft air safety legislation. After logging approximately 15,000 hours in the sky, equivalent to 625 days, Snow still appreciated the wonders he felt during his first flight. When I see little farmhouses and big farms and all that, I just wonder what they're thinking of and what they're doing and whether they're successful and whether they're having a nice life or anything. I think the fact that you can see a great deal of nature that you never see from a car. You can see nature working and uh, what it is. And in a car, you know what you, what you see. A lot of other cars are <laughs> driving alongside you. different world. I, I felt I was floating through the air. I loved it. 
A 50 cent plane ride near Revere Beach got Julie Goldman hooked. He had to fly. Airplanes would take Goldman on a wondrous lifetime journey from Boston Harbor to the chilly North Atlantic, from witnessing shipwrecks to chauffeuring the heavyweight champion of the world. I was a kid, the Julius was a name that they made fun of. Julius Caesar got hit in the beezer with an ice cream freezer and I'd whack him. <laughs> and finally we shot into the Julie, which was better. Julius Goldman was born in 1912 in Chelsea, Massachusetts. When he was five years old, his mother died from influenza, leaving him and his brother to be raised in an orphanage. His father later put the boys to work on a 50-acre farm in Middleborough. Julie's father pulled him out of school after the eighth grade so he could work full-time on the farm. Not happy with his future prospects, Goldman ran away from home. On my way to Boston from the farm, and I tried to join the Marines. And uh, when they examined me, the surgeon examined me and took my clothes off. He says, how old are you? And I said, 18. And he says, well, you better go home and grow up. And they kicked me out. Undeterred, Goldman went to an Army recruitment office in Providence and enrolled in the 7th Field Artillery. The 14-year-old would serve for two years before getting honorably discharged for being underage. Goldman later earned a living as a truck driver, making round-trip deliveries to Lewiston, Maine, six days a week. At age 21, the day before his wedding, he thought it would be fun to take his bride, Florence Lerman, on an airplane ride. Coming back by this little airport in Revere, and there was a big sign up there, 50 cents a ride. And we had 13 bucks between us, and we had to spend a buck, and I said, spend a buck? She said, okay. And we went and bought a ride, 50 cents each. When we landed, I decided I wanted to learn to fly, but I had no money. To take flying lessons, the entrepreneurial Goldman had to get creative. I pretend I was interested in buying a particular airplane. I would need a demonstration, and I'd get a demonstration 15 minutes, and they'd let me fly it. And uh, what I didn't know about flying would fill 10 buildings, but, <laughs> but I got the 15 minutes. Bit by bit, Goldman accumulated enough flight time to make him eligible for his pilot's license. The Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor soon determined how he'd use it. On December 8th, 1941, he signed up for the U.S. Army Air Corps. In order to get in, I had to do some things physically. Somebody had whacked me in the nose, and when I went to take my medical, they said I couldn't get in because I had a deviated septum. I went to a doctor and had him cut my, the bones out of my nose. I come back, and he says to me, that's okay, you're persistent, he said, but you weigh too much. I weighed 218 at the time. I said, I'll be back. And in five weeks, I got off the 18 pounds. Assigned to the second ferrying group out of Delaware, Goldman embarked on journeys that went well beyond his quickie 15-minute trips in Revere. I was in Newfoundland base as chief pilot flying the North Atlantic. And I started to think of what I was going to do after the war. And I thought that I would fly lobsters in C-46s because I had trained in 46s. and. Newfoundland had a lot of lobsters, and during that time I also thought of the little airport that I had got my first ride in, which was known as Muller Field. During the war, Muller Field had been used as a testing ground for Army weasels, amphibious vehicles which tore up the old runways. Feeling nostalgic about the place where he first learned to fly, Goldman bought the crater-ridden airfield from the government. He filled in the land, rebuilt the runways, and renamed it Revere Airport. He also opened a flight school there, which quickly became a popular draw. All our training after the war grew like topsy was because the government was paying for it. Fellas didn't have any money, and a lot of our pilots today on the airlines started on the GI Bill. From 1946 to 1961, Goldman's flight school logged more than 169,000 hours without an accident. Some of his students went on to become airline pilots and astronauts. Goldman's services as a pilot were also in heavy demand. In an age when TV was still a new medium, he was the go-to guy for many of Boston's top newspapers, ferrying photojournalists to train accidents, shipwrecks, and various natural disasters. In 1956, Goldman experienced his most memorable assignment off the foggy coast of Nantucket. I got a telephone call from the Herald and they said that they had an accident out to sea of the Andradoria and was hit by the uh, 
Stockholm. And I should go out and get pictures. And I said, how'd they hit? And they said, in the fog. I said, how do you expect me to find it if they got it, couldn't see each other? And I hung up. I got 10 minutes later, I got a call from the American, and I got it from the Globe. And every, every newspaper editor wanted to go out there. Goldman witnessed and helped document a massive rescue operation over the Atlantic. Of the Andrea Doria's 1,706 passengers, all but 51 people were saved. Nothing struck me. I did tornadoes and fires and explosions and floods. And so to me, it was just another job. In addition to being an air taxi for photojournalists, Goldman found himself shuttling the rich and famous around New England. His favorite passenger was Rocky Marciano, Brockton's very own heavyweight champion of the world. Goldman used to regularly fly Marciano back and forth from his training camp at Grossinger's Hotel in the Catskills. Back at Revere Airport, what was happening on the ground was just as interesting as what went on in the air. For starters, the winter runways were the envy of every small airport in New England. It happened to be that I was the only small airport in the country that had a snowblower. And how I got it was that when I was in Newfoundland flying, they had a snowblower up there, and I was amazed at how much it cleared snow. It had two engines, and it was throwing snow 100 feet to either side. Through war assets here, I finally got a snowblower for my little field. And much to Goldman's surprise, nearby Logan Airport wanted the sand in his marsh to expand their runways. The runways were originally pumped up from muck in the ocean from the harbor. Goldman had a buyer for sand, but he also had a problem. It was illegal to dig below sea level on the coast. So I went to the city uh, of Revere and talked to the building inspector, and he gave me a permit to build a seaplane base. In order to make the seaplane base, I had to take the fill out. And uh, I sold it to Logan, and they took a million, million and a half yards. We called it Revere Seaplane Base. That kind of ingenuity was behind Goldman's lifetime success as a businessman and as a pilot. Revere Airport was closed in 1963. However, Revere Airways and Goldman's aviation legacy lives on in the cockpits of thousands of his students. Flying like a bird. <laughs> I just couldn't, couldn't help visualizing myself up there. Uh, of course, the people of that time said these fellows were nuts and they were trying to kill themselves. But uh, I wanted to fly. A half century ago, John Griffin made a bold prediction. As his industry peers mocked him, Griffin declared that in his lifetime, he would see more people cross the ocean by airplanes than by steamships. Partially due to his own efforts, that prediction came true only a few years later. Inspired by Charles Lindbergh's historic solo flight across the Atlantic, Quincy's John Griffin desperately wanted to be a pilot. While an engineering student at Northeastern University, he took flying lessons at the Squantum Salt Marsh, two miles from his home. I was not one of the moneyed few <laughs> who could afford to fly. And I decided I was going to work out some way that I could. I noticed back in the hangar, the new airplane, and it never moved. And I started making inquiries about it. It was 1930, the beginning of the Great Depression. The airplane's owners needed cash immediately and happily sold it to Griffin for $1,000, about one-sixth of its original value. Griffin leased out his plane to flight instructors and also transported passengers. With a fleet of one aircraft, East Coast Airways was born. Aviation was growing, interest in flying was growing, and I was interested in, for my own purposes, in making it grow. Wanting to learn about planes he could not afford and planes not available to civilian pilots, Griffin joined the Massachusetts National Guard. In the meantime, he was also providing airmail service for the Boston and Maine Railroad throughout New England and Eastern Canada. We were expected to fly if it was humanly possible without killing ourselves and because the only revenue was the airmail. 
literally. Flying the mail was an extremely risky profession. President Roosevelt had tried to save money by having the Army take over the airmail. However, after losing 10 planes in a month, it was clear that the Army did not have enough experience flying in bad weather. For Griffin, the only thing worse than thunderstorms was a shortage of mail. No mail meant no paycheck. So he personally made sure his mail pouch was never empty. What does it take to make a pouch? One letter. So I went over and bought a card of airmail stamps. Every time I had an, an overnight in Montreal, I would uh, address to myself, I would drop the letter in the box. I had no more overnight cancellations. I have no idea whether there was other mail or not, but at least mine was there. <laughs> in between airmail jobs, Griffin slowly built his one-plane East Coast Airways into a flight school and training facility for aircraft mechanics. Prior to and during World War II, Griffin School trained more than 2,000 pilots and mechanics for the military. Griffin himself volunteered to fly cargo for the U.S. Army Air Corps. Meanwhile, he remained chief pilot for the Boston, Maine Central Vermont Airways, which was later sold by the railroad and renamed Northeast Airlines. The government seized about 50% of their airplanes, put them into military service. Uh, they painted them all olive drab, <laughs> military, with the necessary insignia. They didn't draft any of our pilots, to the best of my knowledge, but they said, we're looking for volunteers. In 1941, Griffin met Mary Ormsby, one of the first six air hostesses hired by Northeast Airlines. It was a glamorous position at the time, the local newspaper described Miss Ormsby as perky as a daisy in her becoming little Puritan uniform. She came through the cockpit door and I said, hey cutie, or something to that effect, where the hell is the, is the crew coffee? <laughs> that was the first I ever saw of my wife. So we're now going into, what, 57 years, I think. <laughs> Still officially with Northeast Airlines, Griffin set up weather stations in the Arctic and helped navigate new air routes across the North Atlantic to Europe. German subs were raising hell with our coastal shipping. One of my early trips across the Atlantic at night, and I saw gunfire on the surface. I said, Jesus. Nothing here they could be shooting at except us. Sure enough, the submarines there were spotting us, so I issued an advisory to the pilots. Until further notice, we're the only ones up there, so fly without lights at night. In his retirement years, one of Griffin's proudest achievements would be his successful campaign to secure veteran status for his fellow Northeast pilots. Although they wore military uniforms, Griffin and his peers were never officially sworn into the Army. At a couple of times along the way, I was told, forget it. I said, I'm not forgetting it. I stayed with it for two or three years, telephone and letters and so forth. And finally, the Department of Defense said, sure, you guys are veterans. After the war, Griffin refocused on building up his East Coast aviation business at Hanscom Air Force Base. Marketed as a full service operation with a can-do attitude, East Coast included flight and maintenance schools, an air taxi service, and an aircraft dealership. He was also a tireless promoter of general aviation, placing airplanes in department store windows and radio station booths to generate public buzz. Griffin's national reputation and defense background made him a trusted advisor to congressional committees on aviation. During the Eisenhower administration, he was a leading candidate for undersecretary of the Air Force. Griffin's influence on aviation is still evident today. Since he founded East Coast Aerotech in 1932, the school has trained more than 25,000 airline pilots and mechanics. His vision for commercial aviation was best symbolized by the bold prediction he made in 1954 at a public policy forum. My statement was that during my lifetime, 
more people would start crossing the ocean by air than by ships. When I made that prediction, they almost laughed me out of the room, and one fellow said, uh, Captain Griffin, are you trying to tell us that the American public will fly across the ocean in aircraft that will not float if they go down? My reply was, sir, all we need is a little more technical development, pressurized cabins, oxygen, and a few more niceties, and people aren't going to think about landing in the water. You can come from nothing and still make something out of yourself. Uh, depends on your own personality and your own drive. In 1943, eager to fight in World War II, John Roach visited nine Army recruitment centers. Nine times he was turned away. A tenth recruitment office sent the recent high school graduate to Tuskegee, Alabama. There, Roach would learn to fly a plane before he even learned how to drive a car. But more importantly, he helped prove to America that racism was not only morally wrong, it was also militarily counterproductive. From what my mother tells me, uh, ever since I was in the baby carriage, I used to point up at airplanes. Uh, we were living in the south end of Boston, which was within the traffic pattern of Logan Airport at that time. So every time an airplane went by, I used to point at it, simply because of the noise, I'm sure. As a boy, Roach would beg for pennies on Saturdays to fund his favorite activity across the bay. Once I had four cents, two cents to go across and two cents to come back, then I would go across on the ferry, hang on the fence at Logan Airport and watch the airplanes take off and land for about three or four hours. That curiosity later led to countless hours at the Boston Public Library, where a teenage roach devoured volumes on aerodynamics. It was just amazing that a hunk of material the size of an airplane could soar through the air. It just fascinated me. His other passion was reading about current events. There was a barber shop on Albion Street in the south end of Boston, and every Saturday morning they used to get the Afro-American newspaper, and they would carry a special section on black pilots who, who were learning to fly down at Tuskegee. And I followed this religiously every Saturday morning. I'd go into the barber shop, sit down, read the paper. The barber never bothered me at all. Upon graduation from high school, Roach hoped to become one of those Tuskegee pilots. But nine different recruitment offices turned him down claiming that Negroes weren't wanted in the Army Air Corps. Roach knew otherwise. By 1943, black air cadets had been already training for three years and had flown their first combat missions over Tunisia. Roach's persistence paid off. A 10th Army recruiter accepted his application. I had been reading a lot about airplanes, Boston Public Library, and wherever I could get my hands on airplanes. So when I arrived at Keesler Field, I was familiar with the names, locations, parts, and pieces of an airplane. Uh, the only thing is I had never touched one. Roach began training to fly the short-range B-25 bomber in October of 1944. The thing that struck me the most when I started flying was, why did they restrict the black people from flying airplanes? There was nothing on the airplane, nothing in the airplane, that had to do with the color of your skin. No airplane that I have ever flown ever refused to obey my commands simply because my skin was black. But while race didn't matter in the cockpit, Roach found that it mattered a lot in Walterboro, South Carolina. The small town was home to both an Air Corps gunnery school and a prisoner of war camp for Germans captured overseas. The German prisoners, when it came lunchtime, uh, under guard, of course, were brought into the town, into a restaurant. When they finished their lunch, they would go back out to the work area, take cutting grass along the highways or whatever their job was. And uh, however, the Tuskegee Airmen, if we were in town, we could not go into that same restaurant and have lunch because it was against the law for black people to eat in a restaurant that was made for white people. While Roach was still learning the ropes, Tuskegee fighter pilots were assigned to protect U.S. bombers in missions over Nazi-occupied Europe. A lot of the units that were already over there if they were attacked by German fighters, they would leave the bombers and go and try to destroy the German fighters and become aces or try to drive the planes away. And as they chased those Germans, other Germans would come in and shoot down a lot of the bombers. They were losing 50 and 60 bombers on some of those missions. Colonel Davis said, 
as long as we are escorting those bombers, we will not leave them. We'll drive the enemy off and come back. Drive them off and then come back. So we never had an ace in the Tuskegee Airmen. However, with all those missions, two, over 200 missions, the 332nd Fighter Group and the 99th Fighter Squadron never lost a bomber to an enemy fighter. Roach's B-25 Bomber Group graduated on August 4, 1945, a few days before World War II ended with the atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The combat missions which Roach had trained for were no longer needed. Opting to stick with a military career after the war, Roach became the first and for a while the only black pilot stationed at Hanscom Air Force Base in Bedford, Massachusetts. Right after Roosevelt died, Truman took over and he realized we had two separate air forces, one black and one white, spending twice as much money. Uh, flying suits that were made for flyers, if they were coming to the Tuskegee Airmen, had a certain part number. If they were going to a white outfit, they had a certain part number. Same flying suit. So when Harry saw that, he said, enough of this. He did away with segregation. At least from my experience, uh, nothing could have worked better. I didn't have any worries about it. Uh, because I figured, well, this is up north, uh, we shouldn't have any problem. Uh, to this day, again, those guys were as good as the Tuskegee Airmen were, uh, as far as our relationship. John Roach enjoyed a long career as a pilot and aircraft technician at Hanscom, serving in transport missions during the Korean and Vietnam Wars. One of his most memorable assignments was delivering a new aircraft control tower, fully assembled, from Bedford, Massachusetts to Saigon. The airplane we used was a C-124. They slid it into the airplane, closed the front doors. We took off and flew into Saigon while the, the airport was under fire, enemy fire. I remember my navigator saying, we better get the heck out of here before these guys learn to shoot. And the people were shooting all around the place, but there were no bullet holes in the airplane. I guess it was just an act of God that we didn't get hit. My concern was to get the airplane on the ground. Uh, if you're going to get hit, you're going to get hit. If you're not, you're not. There's no way you can see the bullet coming and try to dodge it, so there's no point in worrying about it. Roach later became an inspector for the Federal Aviation Administration, eventually running the entire FAA operation at Logan Airport. But it was his days in Alabama that continued to inspire him. He has spent much of his retirement giving talks about the history of the Tuskegee Airmen. This is the entrance door. There's a release hatch right here that allows the door to drop and you can see from the size of the uh, entrance here, uh, one of the reasons that they limited the size of pilots during World War II. I tell this to the kids in school. You must learn to live with people. If people won't accept you, then you proceed about your business and let them worry about that. Every time I go to bed at night, I say, thank God for meeting the people that I did, white or black. I saw Sputnik right from this yard out here. And, flew over. and I knew the world would never be the same. As a test pilot for the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Colonel Charles Chip Collins took countless risks to evaluate top secret aircraft for the U.S. Air Force. Ironically, he is best known for a plane he did not control, a plane he confidently let guide itself. Collins made the first coast-to-coast -coast flight using inertial navigation, a gyroscoped-based system that would later become critical to the Apollo space program. The principle is still vital today to the pinpoint guidance of missiles, nuclear submarines, and the space shuttle. But before Collins would have a chance to contribute to the space program, his aviation path first had to go through Tokyo. Well, my mother insists that I never wanted to play with trucks or tractors or didn't want to be an Indian or a cowboy, <laughs> and I, I'd, I'd run around making noise like an airplane with, a, with a, some kind of an airplane, and, uh, and I persisted in that right through until uh, till now. <laughs> Charles L. Collins was born in 1919 on a farm in Louisville, Kentucky, where career inspiration would come early. Taking a walk with his grandfather on a rainy afternoon, the five-year-old boy stumbled across a World War I biplane grounded in a nearby field. Because it was kind of late in the afternoon and I saw this pilot. He was so tall, 
and he had a leather jacket on. It came down below his waist, and, and boots, and uh, a helmet and goggles. And I went over to the airplane, and I wanted to touch that airplane so badly, but I knew I shouldn't. And the guy said, Sonny, you want to touch that airplane? And man, when I touched that airplane, it transferred something that stuck with me to the day. As a child, Collins would later discover Bowman Field, a runway on the outskirts of Louisville. It would become a favorite hangout where he could do odd jobs to earn free airplane rides. At age 15, he took his first lessons on a Piper Cub, and then the pivotal moment experienced his first solo. You know, I think it was typical of everybody's solo flight. Uh, can't believe how much faster the airplane hops in the air and you suddenly realize that not only are you up there, but now you're gonna to have to get back down. The future test pilot soon demonstrated a flair for adventure. I used to have a girlfriend who lived out in the country and I'd rent the airplane and very illegally land in a field and take her up for a ride when I wasn't even qualified to do that. And I'd come back and land and they'd say, Chip, where'd you land? I'd say, well, I didn't land anywhere. They said, well, what do you how low did you fly? I said, oh, well, not very low. Well, what are you dragging all that hay behind the tail skid? <laughs> Collins' youthful mischief was matched by a passionate idealism. In 1941, Collins and a flying buddy headed north to volunteer for the Royal Canadian Air Force, which had been contributing pilots to the British war effort. After Pearl Harbor, a U.S. Army recruiter came looking for him and other Americans who got an early start in World War II. He said, don't you want to come home and fight under your own flag? And I said, well, we're all under the same flag. We're all allies. He says, yeah, but wouldn't you want to fly your own equipment? Well, when he finished with me, I stood up and threw my chest out and went down to the car. And <laughs> they enlisted me in the Army Air Corps. Then they discharged me from the Canadian Air Corps, gave me my law book and sent me home with leave. Collins assumed his Canadian training would qualify him for an advanced flight course, but his military records had been destroyed in a train accident. At Maxwell Field in Montgomery, Alabama, it soon became clear he had more experience than some of his instructors. It wasn't long before Collins was training new recruits himself. I can remember waking up at nighttime, hollering, pull out, pull out, because we were teaching air to ground gunnery. And these kids would come down with target fixation, and I'd say, pull out, pull out, pull out, pull out, and we'd do an accelerated stall. Well, teaching was infinitely more difficult to me and, uh, than, than the combat. <laughs> I mean, these kids, I felt like, but when I finally got out of there, I was thought that these kids were determined to kill me. They could, they could want to see how far they could go and there wasn't anything they could get themselves into that they thought that I could always get them out. Itching to get into combat himself, Collins eventually wound up in McCook, Nebraska, where he was in one of the first groups of pilots to learn how to fly the Boeing B-29 Super Fortress. The B-29 represented a major shift for the Air Force. Instead of pilot and co-pilot, the B-29 had an aircraft commander oversee an 11-man crew of pilots, gunners, bombardiers, a navigator, and radar operator. Aircraft Commander Collins was assigned to the crushed coral runways of Tinian in the Mariana Islands. The South Pacific B-29 base is best known as the place where the Enola Gay took off to drop the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It is also where Collins began most of his 35 bombing missions over Japan. Some of those B-29 missions resulted in an unexpected meteorology lesson, the discovery of the jet stream off the Asian coast. We started on the target and the navigator would say, what's wrong with the radar? He said, the target's backing off of the scope. Uh, well, you're proceeding and the target's supposed to come down the scope. But this, the target was going up, which literally meant we were going backwards. The core of a jet stream as we know today can be in excess of 200 miles an hour. Well, when we were flying at 195 was our cruise speed, <laughs> it would be easy to see why we were doing a, a reverse. We were flying backwards when we got into it. After the war, Collins landed at Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio, then the Air Force's primary center for research and development. Collins found the idea of being a test pilot alluring. 
At Wright Field, Collins did flight test examinations of numerous captured enemy German and Japanese aircraft, some of which were still in the research and development stage. A routine assignment transporting a scientist to an airbase in New Jersey would later evolve into a dramatic career change. I was immediately suspicious because I was going to be a career Air Force person and I was suspect of all scientists, that, that, that civilians at that point, feather merchants as we call them. Inertial principles will be used in all the guidance systems of the future. Collins was traveling with Dr. Charles Stark Draper of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a leading pioneer of guidance, navigation, and control systems for the military. So I'm dreaming along on my course, confident that I'm going to get to McGuire Air Force Base in good time. And I look back, and this, this, this short little man was on his hands and knees, and he had a roll of legal cap-sized paper on the, on the aisle of the airplane. He had his... Uh, sleeves rolled up with garters holding them up and a green celluloid eye shade and he was doing uh, second, third, fourth order equations with, and I, I thought, boy, I really got a live one this time. In 1947, Doc Draper remembered the gregarious Kentucky pilot when he needed someone to test top secret aircraft at his new facility at MIT. But Collins had envisioned a career in the Air Force, and the military was offering a better salary. Get your hind end up here, he recalls Draper saying. I will take care of the money. Collins relocated to Hanscom Air Force Base in Bedford, Massachusetts. From propeller-driven planes to jets and helicopters, the new civilian pilot practically tested everything in the Air Force pipeline. Some of the aircraft he flew inevitably never made it to the production line. Small incremental tests in the late 1940s and early 50s led to Collins' own momentous event. Doc Draper had developed an inertial navigation system, a groundbreaking way to guide an aircraft to its destination without any outside communication. SPIRE, which stood for Spatial Inertial Reference Equipment, passed its ultimate test in February 1953. Taking off from Bedford, Massachusetts, a Spire-guided aircraft landed 13 hours later in Los Angeles without any radio contact or in-flight adjustments by a navigator. Well, it was the first time that an airplane had been flown essentially hands-off. I, I, I got the airplane in the air and engaged the autopilot. So it was the first coast-to-coast -coast, uh, inertial system uh, that took the airplane, guided the airplane from departure to destination finite accuracy. That was a real first. The top secret journey was later duplicated for a CBS News crew in 1958. Journalist Eric Severide described the Spire gyroscope as an airplane's new eyes, ears, and brains. It became the pilot, co-pilot, navigator, radio, and compass all rolled into one. Our first inertial system weighed 10,000 pounds. It would barely fit in this room and it just barely fit in a B-29 and then ultimately a C-97, and it's now in the Smithsonian. It weighs 10,000 pounds. And today, the inertial systems are triply redundant on airplanes. They're like a basketball, you know. The public test of Spire came only months after Collins saw the Soviet satellite Sputnik fly over his Westford home. The technology would become vital for the development of the Apollo rocket program and man's first trip to the moon. While the history books all mention astronaut Neil Armstrong, there simply isn't enough room to mention Draper, Collins, or the thousands of others who quietly made space travel possible. It has often been said that aviation has made the world a smaller place. The world of New England aviation is even smaller. At different times during World War II, Tuskegee Airman John Roach and test pilot Chip Collins were trained on the same base in Alabama. Truman's integration later brought them together at Hanscom Air Force Base in Bedford. Crocker Snow, Julie Goldman, and John Griffin all braved the icy North Atlantic, forging a course that commercial airlines still rely on today. And Ann Wood and John Griffin both enjoyed careers at Amelia Earhart's Northeast Airlines. 
Later in life, all six pilots shared their love for aviation as members of the Aero Club of New England. The accident record of older pilots is better than of younger pilots. To me, it wasn't history, it was a job. <laughs> I just did a job that I was hired to do, and uh, I did a lot of them. These are only some of the unsung heroes who helped to bring us from the days of navigating by cows and railroad tracks to the era of unmanned space travel. Although New England's aviation pioneers will never attain the same fame as the Wright brothers, their accomplishments in the skies will certainly live on. I've often thought to myself, I've wondered whether I was born at the right time or not. I could have done more in the barnstorming days of aviation after World War I. And then I thought, no, I'd be better if I could be young enough to be an astronaut. But then I say, you're foolish, Charles. I was born at the best time. I got part of the open cockpit era of the 30s, and I got through World War II, and I got right through into the space program. If I had to do over again, I don't think I would have changed one bit of it. There are several people in this Aero Club of New England who are legendary, although they didn't develop aviation, they certainly caused it to grow and grow safely. I got into the Aero Club in 1947. It was after I opened the airport at Revere. The Aero Club today is a very vital, ongoing institution and has done great amount of good works, particularly in the scholarship department. It's a club that wants to do something for the thing it loves, and that is air transportation. Mm -hmm.